Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Melissa Begg, and I have the great honor of being the Dean of the Columbia School of Social Work. We're delighted to welcome today's distinguished scholar, Dr. Reuben Jonathan Miller, as our guest speaker in the Dean's Lecture Series on the Scholarship of Race and Racism. This series has been created to highlighted research that examines and promotes the well-being of Black Americans, and we're thrilled that Dr. Miller could join us today. Through this series, our community has a chance to come together to explore the complex system of racist structures and policies that result in inequities, with a particular focus on disparities in economic opportunity, educational outcomes, criminal justice, healthcare access, and wellness. And I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. Now I have the pleasure of introducing our moderator for today, a truly wonderful colleague and a member of our Columbia School of Social Work community, Dr. Kathy Boudin. Dr. Boudin is the co-director and co-founder of the Center for Justice at Columbia University. Her research interests include the impact of higher education on incarcerated women, recidivism rates and life experiences of people serving long sentences and parole policy, and the experiences of adolescents with incarcerated mothers and the role of peer support. Her work focuses on the causes and consequences of mass incarceration and the development of strategies to transform the current criminal justice system and deal with the day-to-day -day damage that the system has caused. Based on her own experiences, Dr. Boudin has focused on strengthening mother-child relationships in prison, bringing back college to Bedford Hills Correctional Facility after the termination of Pell Grants, and building a community response to the HIV AIDS epidemic. Dr. Boudin also founded the Coming Home Program at the Spencer Cox Center for Health at Mount Sinai St. Luke's. Uh, she developed a restorative practice program inside prisons for long-termers, many of whom were sentenced as juveniles. She's also developing policy initiatives to release aging people from prison and to reform the parole system. Her work is based on participation and leadership from those who are most deeply affected by mass incarceration. Dr. Boudin has uh, numerous articles out there in the literature, and she's also editor and co-author of the book, Breaking the Walls of Silence, AIDS and Women in a New York State Maximum Security Prison. Dr. Boudin, thank you for being here. Thank you very much for inviting me. And I am really honored to be able to introduce uh, Reuben Jonathan uh, Miller and his book. I, I think his, his book, as most of you know, is called Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the afterlife of mass incarceration. <clears throat> he is a sociologist, criminologist, uh, and social worker who teaches at the University of Chicago in the School of Social Service Administration. In Halfway Home, Race, Punishment, and the Afterlife of Mass Incarceration, Reuben Miller places the experience of coming home from incarceration as part of the larger issue of the exclusion from our society of an entire part of the population people of color and their entire communities. Ruben's Miller, Ruben Miller's book both provides the deeper analysis of why re-entry programs don't work, precisely because they are tied to the larger situation of exclusion from society. The punishment paradigm that has created the largest system of incarceration per capita in the world of people in prison, here focusing on black and brown people. And then when people come home, they face the 45,000 federal and state laws that regulate the lives of people who have been accused, coming home from prison or on probation in the community, that impact on relationships, housing, jobs, and on the deeper issue of identity. In his chapter on Cinnamon, he movingly opens with the song Cinnamon, sung by Nina Simone, the deeper definition of a person who has sinned and is never able to escape that identity. But the key to his book is the integration of the failure of reintegration program, reentry programs to the larger reality of exclusion of people from black and brown communities from society. And his book brings people as human beings with life histories that the reader can understand where the failures are. They don't end in the life of those who feel like failures and are failing to make it, but it leaves you with the understandings of the failure of our society. As he says, it requires us to get close to people we've learned to fear and dismiss. This is the story told by the expertise of Reuben Johnson, Jonathan Miller, who lived this life with family members, a father, a brother, and friends who have been in prison. He says, incarceration is a subject that I cannot shake. It haunts me like it haunts the men and women whom I followed. I write from my experience as a scholar, 
as an advocate, and as a man with loved ones who have spent time in prison. I'm happy to introduce Ruben Jonathan Miller. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Kathy, for that just lovely introduction. Thank you for, for uh, making time to, to spend with me today. It's always such an honor uh, to, to spend time with you and, 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 and with Cheryl. Um, I got a chance to meet Cameron and just the folks at uh, the, 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 the Center for Justice. You just do powerful, important work and it, it, it matters. Obviously it matters. Um, thank you also to Professor Begg for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to offer the Dean's lecture. Uh, and, 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 and thank you also to old friends and new, especially Professors Patton, Cogburn, Boudin, uh, who gave the introduction, Downey. Uh, thanks uh, also to Jay Holder and Jarrell Williams, um, Professor Western and Professor Harcourt, all of whom have been supportive of my work over the years uh, and, 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 and who take different parts in the struggle, uh, what we might call a lo the long struggle uh, for justice. Thank you also to the faculty and staff at the School of Social Work and the Department of Sociology for being gracious hosts over the last couple of days, uh, meeting with me uh, to chat about their work and my work and, 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 and the connections between the two. I, I don't take your time uh, for granted. I, I very much appreciate it. So today I'm going to talk about mass incarcerations afterlife, about the journey home and what it involves, about um, what uh, Scottish criminologist Fergus McNeil and his colleague Crystal Baines called uh, mass supervision, focusing on what I call a supervised society, this thing that we've erected through our laws and our policies, and about citizenship in the carceral age. And the premise is simple. I think we have to reimagine the problem if we're ever going to change it. So let's begin with how we think about the problem. I want to start with two of my heroes that'll help us in this, in this, in this journey to reimagine things. The first, James Baldwin. The second, Nina Simone. We'll begin with Baldwin. The year is 1965, it's October. Baldwin is famously debating William F. Buckley, a man called the father of American conservatism at the storied Oxford Debate Society. The resolution, the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. This whole debate is on YouTube. You can check it out if you'd like to. Baldwin wins, it's the spoiler. Of course he does. You can't lose if you're James Baldwin. The resolve is yes, of course, the American dream is at the expense of the American Negro. And there was absolutely an expense. There were costs involved. Those costs include and go beyond the practices of slavery. Slavery had a cost, labor has a cost, and this labor was stolen. Slave labor is necessarily stolen and there was exploitation, but really the question was absurd. It was 1965, we had a Voting Rights Act and voter intimidation, a Jim Crow South and redlining in the North, whiteness, Baldwin says, was sustained through black suffering. And in one of the most memorable lines in the debate, he reminds us of the black condition. Now, leaving aside all the physical factors one can quote, leaving aside the rape or murder, leaving aside the quote, bloody catalog of oppression, which we are too familiar with anyway, what the system does to the subjugated is destroy his sense of reality. In the case of the American Negro, Baldwin says, from the moment you are born, every stick and stone, every face is white. Since you have not yet seen the mirror, you suppose you are too. It comes as a great shock, he says, that around the age of five or six or seven, that you discover the flag to which you have pledged allegiance, along with everybody else has not pledged allegiance to you, to see Gary Cooper killing off the Indians. And although you were rooting for Gary Cooper, the Indians are you. It comes as a great shock, he continues, to discover that the country to which is your birthplace and to which you owe your life and your identity has not in this whole system of reality erected any place for you. You realize that you're 30, you're having a terrible time. In fact, you've been through a certain kind of mill and the most serious effect is again, not the catalog of disaster, Baldwin says. The policeman, the taxi driver, the waiters, the landlady, the banks, the insurance company, the landlord, the quote, millions of details, 24 hours out of every day that spell out to you, you are a worthless human being. It's not just that. What is worse is that nothing you have done, and as far as you can tell, nothing you can do, will save your son or your daughter from having the same disaster. 
I'm coming to the same end. The next hero is Nina Simone. It's 1962. Miss Simone sits at a piano for a live recording of Center Man at the Village Gate nightclub. Moaning in the break, the drum and hand clap drive the beat, each keystroke expressing the urgency of the moment. Miss Simone is slender and striking in a white sleeveless gown, her voice full, deep. Oh yeah, she sings, her voice trailing, accompanying the chords she plays with an intensity that's directed toward all of us and none in particular. Oh, Sinner Man, where are you gonna run to? Sinner Man, where are you gonna run to? Where are you gonna run to on that day? This song was recorded in 1962, three years before the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Medgar Evers had not yet been assassinated in the driveway coming home from an NAACP meeting. 14-year-old Addie Mae Collins, 14-year-old Carol Denise McNair, 14-year-old Carol Rosamond Robertson, and 16-year-old Cynthia Wesley had not yet been blown to bits by a white supremacist at the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham. 16-year-old Johnny Robinson was not yet killed by a police officer, and Virgil Ware, just an eighth grade boy, had not yet been murdered by a white supremacist coming home from a rally on the same day in that same city. Those boys' lives had not yet been lost to history. But Black life was no easier in 1962 than it was in 1963 when more people paid attention. And it was no easier in Birmingham than it had been in Harlem or Bronzeville. Where will Sinner Man run and hide to escape judgment on that day? He has sinned, which is to say he has amassed a debt. He must repay it. Les Baxter recorded a show tune cover a decade before, where Sinner Man runs to the moon. But this is a Negro spiritual, one that had been sung in black churches since the turn of the 20th century and whose roots run much deeper. It's a song that should be sung with a tambourine. It's a warning and a call to prayer for the church to get right, to go home. And the debt is a real one. Frederick Nietzsche, the philosopher and polemicist, tells us that the origins of guilt, what he calls bad conscience, come from the material relationship between a lender and a debtor. The debtor, should he fa fail to pay what he owes, offers the lender his very flesh, or the flesh of his wife, or the flesh of his child, to do with as he will. It is a sign of his free will to offer the one thing over which he has mastery, his body, to punish, to torture. The lender takes pleasure in torturing the debtor and at the same time sears his conscience. The pain he inflicts will never be forgotten and the debtor and all who see his punishment will pay their debts from that point forward. This is not far from a distinctly American theological tradition where a sin-sick world with sin-sick souls owe debts to their God. In sinning, they've broken a contract and the debt must be repaid. They must pay with their flesh. This song was sung on the tail end of the long 19th century. The survivors of the last sang it, and they would continue to sing it through the coming Great Depression. If slavery was punishing, the hunger and disrespect that followed was nearly as bad. Miss Simone's version was like the one our great grandmothers and great aunts sang. It was a song of fire and smoke strummed on bass guitars and well-tuned pianos. The hand clap reminiscent of washboards and red lines, cotton thorns and slum clearance. The sinner man runs and hides on earth. His punishment comes from this world, from the Southern horrors Ida B. Wells famously chronicled, and from the long trek north and the crack of the police baton in Harlem and Bronzeville and Black Bottom in Detroit, the sting of eviction and unsolved rapes and murders, the experience of unemployment and hunger, all while hearing from preachers and politicians and social scientists and the do-gooders that move in and out of our neighborhoods with their surveys and cameras and best intentions in tow, that it's really all your fault. It's your refusal to snitch or to keep a man happy or to raise your children or to delay gratification or to shake off the deficits of your culture. This puts you in the position you're in. It's your social disorganization, your disbelief in the legitimacy of law enforcement. It's your legal cynicism. At the end of the day, it's you. In this version, recorded live at the Village Gate, which was once on the corner of Thompson and Bleecker Street, Cinderman seeks respite on Judgment Day. He runs to the rock, to the river, to the sea. He asks for help. 
help me, please hide me, Lord, he says. Even running to God, but sinner man finds no respite. The river boils, the sea bleeds, the rock and God reject the sinner man. God, in fact, says, go to the devil. In this parable, constructed from the traditions of the Southern Black Church, the devil will never be satisfied with his torment. No amount of violence inflicted on his body will ever be enough for the devil. He therefore cries out power, power to the Lord, not as an act of worship, but to acknowledge what is a matter of fact. Sinner man's fate is in the hands of the devil, his enemy. Simone's prophetic lyric, like Baldwin's always timely discourses on race and the human condition, better than most capture the social situation of formerly incarcerated people who find themselves at the mercy of others, but who rarely find mercy. For formerly incarcerated people living in the post-civil rights era, there are few, if any, open doors in the labor or housing market or even within their families. And just like the center man's confession of power when confronted with the power of his adversary, the devil, the admission of legal guilt is brought about through rejection and exclusion, not through fact finding, not through deep introspection, but by the power and force and weight of the crime control machinery that comes down on them and their families. The river boils, the sea bleeds, and the rock and God reject the center man. While social service agencies have long waiting lists, affordable housing options are scarce, and employers, landlords, and their families reject them at every turn. This is in part due to the proliferation of electronic background checks, the advent of what Sarah Lagerson from Rutgers has theorized as a kind of digital punishment, or what Susila Gurusami, a sociologist from the uh, University of Illinois, Chicago, has described as the carceral web. This is where Experian alerts don't come through our emails and text messages when there's a data breach or when our information has been sold to Cambridge Analytica. But when a so-called sex offender moves a few miles from our home, what's worse, their confession does not resolve them from the sin. It brands them a digital scarlet letter marking the conventional citizen as criminal for life and sentencing them to punishment for a lifetime. Hence Simone's lyric, the devil is waiting. Like sinner man who seeks refuge in many places, including outside the court and counsel of his Lord. If we wanna capture what life is like under these conditions, we have to look outside the formal criminal justice system. Let me put this differently. While we must acknowledge the formal mechanisms of exclusion, if we wanna know what life is like for people kept underfoot of the legal apparatus, we have to look outside of it and think about the dynamic lives that people are able to forge and find for themselves despite the law and policy that hems them in. This requires us to reimagine the contours of mass incarceration and to draw anew what we imagine to be its reach, its breadth, its scope. Let's begin with the contours. This is a graph of the US incarceration rate provided by the sentencing project. What it shows us is something that we know too, all too well, that there are over 2 million people or close to 2 million people in any given year in an American jail and prison. And that it hasn't always been that way. Beginning in 1972, we wanted an experiment where we increased the number and rate at which we incarcerated people every year for 27 straight years, resulting in the increase that we see today. And of course, we know that racial disparities when it comes to the criminal justice system are egregious. We know that black Americans are twice as likely to be arrested, five times more likely to be incarcerated. They serve lengthy of sentences, 10% on average at the state level, 20% on average at the federal level for the same crimes as their white counterparts. We know that they're more likely to serve due to mandatory minimum sentences, meaning discretion is taken out of a situation where discretion maybe perhaps would benefit and that criminal justice contact is disproportionate to even the reported crimes in the area. In other words, uh, despite whether or not somebody was actually guilty or innocent, despite whether or not a crime happened in the area in a depreciable amount of time before the police showed up, we know that these arrests and these incarceration rates are still high, are still disproportionate, despite what the community looks like. This is all very important. We've learned a lot from our literature from, what, what, from our studies of prisons and punishment. But the focus on prisons and the police leave a curious yet equally historic phenomenon hidden in plain sight, the rise of what I've called a supervised society. 
Mass supervision, something I alluded to before, has transformed the life worlds of the poor. And so we have to rethink the scope of the problem if we're ever to tackle it. Let's start with the problem. This is a bar graph. And I know that bar graphs don't mean anything in relate without being in relation to other bar graphs. But this is the two or so million people who are currently incarcerated. Hovers anywhere between 2 million to 2.4 million at its height. Compared to the number of people on probation or parole, we know that there are twice as many people on probation or parole in any given year. Switching the unit of analysis, we know that jails and prisons arrest between 11 and 12 million people each year that process through an American jail or prison. Switching the unit of analysis again, which I know is unfair to my quantitative scholars in the, in the, in the, in the, on the call, uh, but, but just allow me to do it. <laughs> we switch the unit of analysis again uh, from the number of people processed through an institution before that to the number of people on any given day from a point in time count to another estimation, this time a number of people who are alive today with felony records. We know that there are 19.6 million people roughly who are alive with a felony record that was estimated in 2016 by Sheriff Shannon and colleagues. This is a figure that's 10 times the size of the American prison system. And we know that even this figure pales in comparison to the number of people who have felony records. 80 million Americans, a conservative estimate put out by the Bureau of Justice Statistics in 2014, are estimated to have a criminal record. What this tells me is that people are managed in far many more places than just jails or prisons. They're managed across multiple sites by multiple actors. The community is where the action is. And the prison, despite its place in the public's imagination, is one relatively small slice of a vast carceral network. To understand it, we have to get close. It requires of us a radical doubt and a persistent proximity, a relentless pursuit of proximity. My question, I think we live in a supervised society. What's it like to live there? My work is a political ethnography of mass incarcerations afterlife, a political ethnography because it's both participant observation, but it's about the way the power flows. It's about the conditions of social life under a, social set of, a certain set of social situations. It's about the experience of social policy, in this case of criminal justice and social welfare policy and their convergence on the people that they target. And this work took place in Chicago, Detroit, and to some extent, New York City uh, over a number of years. So let me show you the contours once more, a different view of it. This is a screenshot of the National Inventory of Collateral Consequences of a Criminal Conviction. This was first curated by the American Bar Association that counted the number of what they call collateral consequences across the country by jurisdiction. And they found that there are over 45,000, as, as Professor Boudin uh, suggested. All politics are local. In New York, there are over a thousand laws, policies, and administrative sanctions that target just people with criminal records, no one else. In my home state, there are over 1,200, including 512 that target employment and volunteering. That number, thinking about employment, increases to 960 laws, policies, and sanctions when you include things like business licenses and occupational licenses and certifications that people need to do things like become barbers, groom dogs, et cetera. There are 180 that limit civic and political participation, 50 constrain family and domestic rights, and 30 limit where one can live. What does this mean? It means in most states, your job applications may be denied if you have a criminal record without anybody telling you a single thing about it. You may not adopt children or be a foster parent. You may have to give up your parental rights. You may not so much as visit someone who lives in a government subsidized apartment. You may be evicted on the whim. Your relationships are fundamentally different. But this is what it looks like from 30,000 feet in the air. These are statistics, the numbers by which their very nature are abstractions. They're not how people live. For that, we have to zoom in. We have to think about the specificities of a life. We have to put flesh on the numbers because we live in our flesh. And we'll look at the experiences in this case of one man, a center man, a man I call Jimmy. Jimmy's a short, affable black man in his mid 40s who I met at the Detroit Reentry Center 
This is a correctional facility that offers residential drug treatment and violence prevention services in Detroit. And Jimmy was diagnosed with bipolar disorder in his late 20s and struggled for two decades with crack and heroin addiction. A mental health technician at the prison took Jimmy off his bipolar medications, saying to him that he had a drug problem, not a mental illness. This meant that Jimmy spent eight years in a Michigan penitentiary without access to drug treatment or counseling. This is before he paroled. After doing six of his 18 month parole in a drug treatment program, he was released on conditions that he would report to his parole officer for a weekly or probation officer for a weekly drug test, attend Narcotics Anonymous group meetings, complete a workforce development training program and get a job. A generally happy man, Jimmy would break into sullen moods, crying during his meetings with his parole officer and breaking into tears during our interview sessions. Fortunately, he had a perceptive parole officer who told him to get a psychiatric evaluation at a mental health clinic. He was diagnosed, of course, with bipolar disorder again and immediately put back on psychotropic medications, which we might see as a victory, the victory of a perceptive uh, probation or parole officer. I met Jimmy at the Rosa Parks Transit Center, the city's main bus terminal, and shadowed him during his first appointment with workforce development. It was February of 2014, one of the coldest days of the year, and Jimmy was underdressed, wearing a black Detroit Tigers jacket and a thin worn skull cap. The address was just under a mile from the terminal, so we decided to walk. During that walk, he was overly concerned with my level of comfort, cracking jokes as we made our way to the Family Social Service Center, trying his best to put me at ease. He told me no less than five times that he appreciated, quote, spending time with a brother like me, and that he was glad to, quote, do something positive. When we got to the address, a gray stone monstrosity not far from Midtown, I understood in a much deeper way why he went through those motions. The building was closed. The loose leaf printout taped to the door had addresses for a few hopefully open workforce development agencies, but the closest one was nine miles from where we were. Ironically, that center was close to the property that Jimmy was helping to rehab. This is the same place that he slept at night. Jimmy was doing off the books demolition work uh, and cleaning newly rehabbed homes uh, for a real estate developer that used to be his dope dealer back in the day. There was no phone number on the printout for the agency we needed to go to, and Jimmy's phone had run out of minutes anyway. He couldn't have called the number if there was one. The bus card that I gave him at our last interview had already run out, and he was counting on me and a new bus card for me to get around for the week, the $40 gift card that I passed out at the end of our interviews as compensation to eat and to refill his prepaid phone card. He also thought he might have been able to, to get a bus card at the center if it was open, but of course the center was closed. If I wasn't with Jimmy, he would have had to have walked the nine miles to the center or risk missing the appointment. And without the bus card that I handed out, he would have to walk miles to the parole office for his weekly drug test, to his AA meetings, to counseling, or he would have to convince someone he knew with a car to give him a ride. He told me people could be sent back to prison for missing such appointments. Not only did he know men who had been quote flopped, meaning sent back to prison for similar reasons, Nearly a quarter of all prison admissions each year are for parole violations just like these. So Jimmy was right. And the price of violation is steep. People who get flopped have to finish their sentences. And Jimmy had 18 months left on his. Even if a probation officer didn't think the violation was serious, they could detain you for 90 days, up to 90 days, in a unit called the I-Drop at the Detroit Detention Center. This was a place specially uh, uh, sort of cartoned off for parole violators. Guards call this, quote, laying the offender down. Jimmy's careful work to ensure I was comfortable paid off. We walked back to the bus depot where my car was parked. I gave him a ride. I did this largely because he needed to, but also because I was convinced he was a nice guy in a bad situation. But when we got to the Workforce Development Center, we learned that the training classes that he was ordered to attend were all full. He was told to put his name on a waiting list and come back the next week in case the parolee, a parolee failed to show up. They did not hand out bus cards to people who were not yet in the program, and they could not guarantee him a spot in the next class. We chatted with the service provider about the opportunities available at the center, grabbed brochures on our way out the door, drove to Coney Island, which is a Detroit diner chain, and, and we debriefed on the day's activities. Jimmy thanked me profusely for the $7 lunch that I bought him for the $40 gift card that I gave out at the end of each interview, and for, quote, being there. He said, for being there. Being there. 
But what did I do? There were so few places Jimmy could turn to for help that he had to cultivate my trust. Like the center man, his life moved from one rejection to another. The mental health worker refused him psychiatric care at prison. The social service agency shut its doors. His only option was nearly impossible to get to without a ride, without me. He may not have had made his appointments that were required of him by his probation officer. And even with my help, the agency had no space and could not accommodate his needs. This would all have to be explained to his probation officer who may or may not believe him. And without his former dope dealer, Jimmy wouldn't even have a place to live. And as we know, homelessness is also a violation of parole. A parole officer, probation officer has to have an address to report to. Jimmy, like the center man, is almost completely at the mercy of others, dependent on the kindness of strangers for food, clothes, and shelter, on the mercy of the police, the courts, or the parole officer taking his word to stay out of jail or prison. And if I was honest with you, I would say to you that I didn't give Jimmy a ride because he was a nice guy in a bad situation. I tell you that I gave Jimmy a ride because I was cold. It was February. It was the coldest day of the year. And I didn't feel like getting on the bus following Jimmy for no nine miles. So I threw Jimmy in my car because I wanted to. I helped Jimmy and helped Jimmy get to the things that he needed to get to completely on a whim. What does this tell us? Our law and policy have locked people with criminal records out of the political economy and culture, out of most meaningful ways that they might support themselves. It's produced a kind of need. It's produced a kind of precarity. It produces harm. What this means is that people with criminal records need other people in ways that people who don't have criminal records may not. And this means that those other people, those third parties, even well-meaning people, now have an asymmetric power relation with them. Employers, criminal justice actors and agencies, licensing bodies and government officials, families, social service providers, landlords, almost anyone else people with criminal records come into contact with are can engage in a power dynamic that is unnatural to the roles that they normally presume. This is in part because helping is risky. This comes from interpretation of liability laws beginning in the 1980s, where families now face eviction for offering housing to people with criminal records. So what began in housing, which I'll talk about in a hot second, has filtered over to employment, uh, into, into, into licensing, into insurance where uh, 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 landlords, employers, et cetera, are put on the hook for crime fighting. They're made responsible for the things that people do on their premises. They can be sued, nuisance ordinances, et cetera. And what they do is they pass on this responsibility to be a crime fighter onto tenants. So now after the passage of these laws, which began in, 19, in the mid 1980s, certainly by 1988, uh, uh, a grandmother can be evicted if she so much as allows a grandson to sleep on a couch if the landlord so chooses to activate that power. There's also the fatigue of parents, partners, and children who are now made to care for people who they may presume as able-bodied who are locked out of the labor market. There's also employers, landlords, and social service agencies who are made responsible for their actions that are subject to lawsuits, reputation loss, and of course, there's NIMBY, not, not in my backyard. One example from housing policy, the so-called one strike rule that comes from a 1996 State of the Union address from President Bill Clinton at the time, who told landlords and told the country that it's time to take the, the crime fighting machinery, it's time to use, use housing as a part of the crime fighting machinery. For too long, tenants had been terrorized by criminals, he said, so-called criminals. And so what he said was the new rule should be one striking year out. If you've been known to have a felony, if you've been known to have broken the law, it doesn't matter when you did it, it didn't, doesn't matter where you did it, you are subject to eviction. And we saw this taken up in public housing. We saw this taken up in HUD. We saw 
the catalyzing of a law that was already on the books, the Anti-Drug Abuse Act of 1988, show up in housing policy at the local level. And what those policies said was that people could be evicted for, quote, any criminal activity on or off the premises, as I mentioned, that was committed by, quote, any member of the tenant's household or any person under the tenant's control. Overnight, girlfriends, grandmothers, lovers, cousins, friends are brought into the crime fighting machinery of the nation because a grandmother can be evicted for letting her grandson sleep on the couch. A lover can be evicted for letting her boyfriend stay with her for a little while. And they were within six months of the announcement at the State of the Union address, evictions increased and denials based on a criminal record in HUD properties had doubled within six months of this address. The stakes are high for people who wanna help, but the stakes are even higher for people with criminal records because legal exclusion at once makes them dependent on others to help them. They need help. They're locked out of the labor market. They're locked out of the political economy and culture. They need to rent a house or, or work, but it also makes them among the least desirable candidates to help. Grandmothers, again, being evicted for letting their children sleep on the couch. Wives, children, lovers being put outdoors. This is a largely unaccounted for vulnerability that changes the nature of everyday relationships. Where an argument with a partner could equal about now with street homelessness. A problem with a coworker could equal the loss of an already scarce work opportunity. If there are 960 laws, policies, and sanctions that, that, that lock people out of the labor market in one state, my state, Illinois, 500 in your state, New York. What does that mean for the nature of, of labor? What does that mean for the jobs people are able to get? Will someone with a criminal record file a complaint when their boss mistreats them? How? It's one of the few jobs they can get their hands on. It takes great resolve and great courage to stand up for things that other people would normally be able to stand up for. How do you vote with your feet? When there are 19,000 employment regulations in this country that lock you out of the labor market. A missed appointment of pissing hot when you meet with your probation or parole officer could equal a trip back to prison and pissing hot could be the use of alcohol for my own brother because substances were involved in the crime for which he was co convicted. He can't drink alcohol. My brother's older than me. A misunderstanding with the case manager equals the loss of a job or food, transportation, drug treatment, counseling, or even time with one's family. We've erected what I call an economy of favors. This is a new catalog of disaster that changes the nature of everyday life where third parties now have incredible leverage. They're empowered by legal exclusion and relationships that were once relations of care and still are. New tensions get introduced because those relationships are now asymmetrical. There's a different kind of power dynamic that's introduced through these practices of legal exclusion and through the practices of punishment that we've enacted for people who would dare to help folks with criminal records. Exchanges of resources are now considered a favor because my grandmother, who would let me sleep on a couch because she loves me, is now risking her neck and the neck of her children and the neck of her other grandchildren when she allows me to sleep on that couch. The formerly incarcerated person, the so-called ex-offender, must put others at ease just to meet their basic human needs. This new social arrangements has life or death consequences. Let me return now to the story of Jimmy Caldwell, this brother who I met in Detroit and tell you a little bit about his relationship with the three most important women in his life. His first is Cynthia, this was his partner. The second is Tabitha, this was his sister. The third is his mother, Ruth. I'll tell you a little bit about Tabitha and then move quickly to Cynthia and Ruth. Tabitha holds his repeated incarcerations against him. She calls him a crackhead, she calls him a criminal. He goes to a birthday party, he loves his nieces and nephews. He's something of the cool uncle for them. And when he goes to the birthday party for the nieces and nephews, Tabitha keeps their toys, the children's toys, locked in her car. 
She won't even bring them into the apartment. Cynthia, his partner, had been with uh, Jimmy for eight years through two bids. He told me when he got out of prison that he didn't want to be with Cynthia anymore. He told me, quote, I want me a hot girl. That's what he said. I'm not casting judgment. That's what he said. So he wanted a hot girl. Cynthia was 15 years older than Jimmy. Jimmy was already, you know, in his 50s or whatever. And he, he said he was a free man. He wanted to, quote, feel free. And he wanted to date him a hot girl, someone who was younger, who was more attractive, who he felt like he wanted to sleep with. I checked in with Jimmy six months later. Jimmy told me that Cynthia had gotten sick. She had a stroke. She ended up going to a comp, what he called a convalescent home, nursing home. I asked what was up with them. He said he was looking for ways to get married. I said, why? Why are you getting married? I thought you wanted to be with somebody else. He said, she's been with me through prison. I'm going to be with her now. I owe it to her. Okay, so a sense of moral obligation, no judgment for me. You know, we stay in relationships for all kinds of reasons. I think that's probably a good one. You know, somebody's been with you for a long time that you, you stay with them there. But even despite what I think, right, like, it doesn't really matter. But when I talked to Jimmy at a moment of candor, at a moment where he felt like he trusted me, after he'd gotten to know me for quite a while, he looked at me and he told me, yo, man, I feel needy, is what he said. I said, what do you mean, Jimmy? He said, I don't have anywhere to go. And he explained to me that without Cynthia, he would have to still sleep in the rehabbed homes, those homes he was de helping to demolish, that he would still be surfing from couch to couch at best. I asked him, what's up with his mother, Ruth? How come you don't go to Ruth's house? Ruth's your mama. You know, she, she, I, I admit, met Ruth, in fact, and, and known how much she cared for. And he said, yeah, I really, I, you know, I love my mom. My mom loves me. She'll definitely look out for me. She'll definitely offer me a place to stay. But this is the problem. Jimmy explained to me that Ruth's landlord told her that if she let Jimmy stay any longer at her house, that he would be, quote, forced to put her out. And so Jimmy told me, quote, I don't want to put her in a situation like that. Here's Jimmy, rejected by the prison, rejected by social service agencies, locked out of the labor market in ways that he might find meaningful, prevented from access to accessing housing as a position of social policy, a social policy of rejection, to borrow the term from Geraldine Downey, Professor Downey in the psychology department. Jimmy not only faces the social policy of rejection and the stigma of a criminal record, but the one person he can turn to in his time of greatest need, the person who he knows will care for him, he can't come around because she'll care for him. And he knows that when she does, because mama gonna do what mama gonna do, when mama does what mama does, she's gonna get put out. This is the economy of favors. It creates instability and precarity. The very things that we say lead to criminal behavior. The very things that we say we enact law and policy to prevent. It creates a power imbalance where natural relations of affection are now tainted by a kind of tension that gets introduced. And it shapes even the most intimate of relationships. It did this for Jimmy. It did it for me. I had to care for my own brother who had been locked up while I was writing this book. There's an excerpt in Time Magazine where I talk about what it means to accept phone calls and what it means to wear the burden of caring for somebody with a criminal record as someone who's never been arrested and as someone who's, quote, broken into the middle class. But it shapes even our most intimate relations the tension that's introduced between me and my brother, the tension that's introduced between Jimmy and his sisters and his sister, the tension that's introduced between Jimmy and Cynthia because Jimmy wants to leave but can't, the tension that's introduced between Jimmy and his mother because his mother calls him and asks him to come over and he doesn't even answer the phone when she calls anymore. If we look from above, we see important things. We see mass incarceration, we see jail and prison expansion, we see voting rights and the elimination of them. 
We see the employment outcomes. We see recidivism rates. We worry about the day's political wins. If we look from below, we see a supervised society. We see a transformed social world. We see the advent of an economy of favors. We see the production of what I've written about as a new kind of citizenship, what I call carceral citizenship. This is an alternate set of laws, an alternate set of rules, an alternate, uh, alternate set of restrictions, an alternate set of benefits for people with criminal records. We see a society in which we force people with criminal records to the outside. We see a society in which we've made it so that people who've caused harm, who we presume have caused this harm, have no place where they belong. The problem of mass incarceration is a problem of citizenship because citizenship at the end of the day is about belonging, belonging to a political community, belonging to a human community, being a fully human participant in that human community. And through our law and policy, we've made it so that the segment of the population that we're most afraid of has no place where they belong. I think we live in strange times. Well, we'd have set every prisoner free today, we still have this supervised society that I'm telling you about. So I think we have to ask different questions. I've tried to ask different theoretical questions. I've tried to ask different empirical questions. You know, where do you look? How do you make sense of it? But the question before us is an ethical one. We live in a supervised society. We've made it. This is what we've created. This is what we've made for one in two families in this country that have an incarcerated loved one. The question is, though we've made a supervised society, though we live in a supervised society, what kind of society do we want? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ruben. I feel like I can call you by your first name because in a way you open yourself up in the way that you write to mm. feel that you're a person that people can connect to. And I'm sure that that's part of what makes the book so po powerful is that people were willing to talk to you because they felt like you understood them. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank and please, you. you call me by my first name because we're friends. <laughs> I call you by your first name because we're friends. <laughs> right. But also, thank you. That's, that's, that's <laughs> such a wonderful compliment. I can't tell you how much I appreciate that. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate that coming from you. You know, just giving you, I mean, just just your your your, your long history of, of, of work for us, for all of us. And I am, I am, I, I will say I am grateful. I am grateful. So thank you. Well, before we go into the, the, all the questions about you, I want to express some gratitude also. I think that it's, it's important that your, your book is about the issues that people face when they come home from prison. Mm -hmm. And certainly when I came home, uh, when Cheryl came home, when a lot of our sisters have come home and brothers have come home, we've watched people struggle to make it. We've watched the failures. We've watched the successes. And the primary successes have been when people had a sense of community. Mm -hmm. But I think the fact that the Columbia School of Social Work accepted Cheryl and myself uh, 2009 to come here and try to work openly as formerly incarcerated people to make this issue be an issue. I'm grateful that all the problems that you describe people face when they come home, that this School of Social Work was willing to accept us and in fact saw perhaps a potential in a contribution that we could make. So. It's good to have the gratitude to happen. So thank you, Ruben. Thank you, School Social Work. Thank you, all my colleagues. We have tremendous questions that have been asked. And uh, I'm going to start with the first question. One of the many beautiful aspects of your book is the way you deftly weave your own emotions, reactions into the text, at the same time reflecting your scholarly observations and analysis. How did you manage to do this during the interview process? Did you find it challenging? Yeah, I appreciate that question very much. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a thank you. Thank you also for that lovely compliment. I, um, what I tried to be was honest. I just, I just really tried my best to be honest. And what I tried to be, and, 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 and in being honest, um, it allows for a kind of vulnerability. And so, you know, during the interviews, that showed up, I hope, in a couple ways. 
in one way it was being honest about being wrong. Sometimes I got stuff wrong. You know, sometimes, sometimes I presume things and I brought those things with me into the interview. Sometimes um, I, I doubled down on what I'm taught as a social scientist, how I'm supposed to conduct an interview, for example, you know, to, to start from a place in some ways of disbelief. Um, and the second thing I tried to do was be honest about what moved me, when it moved me, and how it moved me. And so really, I did a lot of work just getting in touch with myself. You know, at the end of the book, there's, a, there's a, an appendix that I call the gift of proximity. And I make an argument for, for what I call a sociology of being together. And uh, the premise of that is that pain separates us because of social inequality because of social stratification, because of how we treat the other, how we think about the other and othering. So I'll never know what it's like to be deported. I'll never know what it's like to be discriminated against as a woman. Uh, I have not yet experienced the debilitating effects of going through life uh, uh, with someone close to me who's had cancer or something like that. I mean, I have a dear friend um, who struggles with this, but. Uh, and I'm learning now as I age, but I've had my own pains. I've had my own experiences. I've had my own sense of death, uh, my own sense of loneliness and isolation. And I use that not to experience what people experience, how they experience, but I use that to help me walk alongside people who are having a set of experiences. I try to be very much so in touch with myself. I try to, which, which requires me not to look away when things are painful. Some days it's hard, you know, some days it's hard. I think that's social work though. You know, good social workers know how to sit with discomfort because sometimes discomfort is instructive. And I also tried to write in a way that availed the reader of my joys, my pains, my experiences. And the way I experience joy, pain, suffering, celebration with the people who I walked alongside. So that's how I tried to do it. So it was successful. I'm, I'm, you know, it's, 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 it's successful because, um, you know, uh, we're taught to separate ourselves from these things. And when you avail yourself of it, there are things that we might learn uh, uh, that we wouldn't ordinarily see when we do this work of creating barriers and bridges and, 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 and separating ourselves. So I just tried to, I tried to be close and remain close both to my emotions and to the people who I followed. Thank you so much for a very beautiful answer. <laughs> Next question. Your work shines a light on the quote, economy of favors that formerly incarcerated people must sustain. How does that impact the person's self-perception, and ultimately their potential to navigate their way out of supervision? Thank you for that question. The, I think that, um, well, I think that, I, I think it affects people in many different ways because people are so very different. Um, I think it's a kind of burden, though. I think, I think, it's, I think it's a kind of burden. I think that um, what I'm trying to articulate is is a sense of is a general sense of rejection and the things that one has to do to get by in this world and i think that it's a grind and i think that it's an unnecessary grind and i think that it 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 does things like change the way that our social institutions work and so and so and so the way it shows up in people's lives let me let me take this 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 idea of rejection for a hot second you know the the brilliant geraldine downey um, and, 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 and in her lab and, and her students uh, just sitting on a dissertation of, of, of the brilliant Mike Naft, who's um, thinking about uh, the, sort of the experience of, of this, of, of, of rejection as social policy, um, the psychological effects of it, like what it, what it might do. Um, and it, but but what, what we learn from rejection sensitivity, the literature on rejection sensitivity is that people have dissatisfaction in their relationships, they have negative health and mental health outcomes, their sense of self suffers, 
the, 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 the people suffer psychologically because everything around you tells you no. You know, it's interesting. There was a uh, there was a the director of youth services at the Cook County Jail for a few years. Uh, you know, those, those people change in and out quite a bit, but this one not quite a bit, but this one had been there for a while and, and he was over and he said to me, he said, you know, when my grandson does anything good, there's a whole community of folks who are just waiting, clapping, happy, waiting on him to just do, you know, take a step, do just the most ordinary mundane thing. And it just lights up everybody's world. Everybody's lit up waiting on this person to do something good. And he says, I wish that these kids that I work with, he worked with uh, folks who were in uh, ju- you know, juveniles, uh, young, 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 young people, um, teenagers mostly, uh, who have been who have been held in, in in an adult jail. You know, he wanted that for them because he knew that that was missing. What does it mean to live in a world that doesn't light up when you do something well? And what does it mean to live in a world that castigates you when you do something wrong? What does it mean to live in a world when nothing opens or very few things open? It means perhaps you hold precious the few things that do. Might make it a little bit harder to leave that job where the boss mistreats you. Might make it a little harder to leave that relationship where that person mistreats you. Might make it a little harder not to be cynical. Might make it a little harder to trust. So so that's the the interpersonal stuff. Like it it might affect you in that way. I don't know, someone needs to test that. I think uh, Mike Naft is testing that and Geraldine Downey is testing some of that stuff. Um, but, 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 but the question is for me, you know, what does it mean to exist in a world in which the social policies that we've constructed have, have severed people from the social body, have amputated people from the social body, have excluded that, that, that we have a policy of legal exclusion. This, this, this is the problem that I think we need to and can tackle. Okay. Uh, thank you. Your work cites a staggering 45,000 laws that limit the activities of the formerly incarcerated. Rules change from state to state. Is there any central federal oversight body that could take charge of making sense of all this and develop recommendations and best practices that could be deployed by different municipalities? Whose job is this? Whose job should it be? It's, 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 it's such a, it's such a great question. Um, you know, this is this is in some ways the problem of federalism. This is the problem of states' rights. This is the problem of the local. This this is this is this is the problem of there being three thousand counties and three thousand jail systems, for example. This is the problem of there not being one unified criminal justice system, but multiple criminal justice systems. With that said. Um, we see the negative effects of it. We see what happens when a pronouncement's made, when guidelines are set. And so in each area of policy, there are bodies that set things like guidelines. So in housing policies, we look toward HUD, you know, uh, in, 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 in the, 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 the Department of Health and Human Services uh, speak to social welfare and, and, and child welfare policies. And if guidelines are set, um, uh, uh, those guidelines don't dictate, uh, but they certainly shape uh, uh, the course of uh, the way local policy uh, plays out. I'll give you an example of this on the negative side, the, I, the question of parental rights. So during the same kind of 1990s moment um, under the Clinton administration, there were, there were guidelines that were set under the Adoption of Safe Families Act that said that um, uh, after 15 months, no later than 15 months, uh, states must or should uh, should or must uh, proceed with proceedings to terminate uh, uh, the parental rights of 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 incarcerated people. So there's there's this guideline. There's a signal. 15 months is when you sh- must begin. That's 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 the that's the that's the threat. This, but after 15 months, it's too late to begin the termination of parental rights. People initiated this uh, in hopes to reduce the number of children in the child welfare system. People initiated this in hopes to promote adoptions so that people could start adopting, quote, prison babies, <laughs> for example. So this is the guideline that gets set by this, by this, by this uh, parental rights 
Department of Health and Human Services uh, sort of framing and also some legislative acts. Again, the Adoption and Safe Families Act. Well, uh, local state governments interpreted that very differently, but none of them go beyond the 15 months. And so in some states, the termination of parental rights for incarcerated people begins uh, as early as six months. And so something like 30,000 children end up being taken from their parents in something like a 10 year period solely for the cause of incarceration, not because of abuse or, or, or maltreatment or something like that. And so if the guideline can be set negatively, we can start setting positive guidelines in these same agencies. We can move away from these guidelines that, that, that have put us on this course. And then at the local state level, it's very important to think about things like expungement, to think about things like which of the 45,000 laws and policies, which of the 1,000 roughly in each state are necessary to allow for the kind of safety that people are hoping to seek. So in the state of Illinois, for example, you couldn't be a barber, even if you were trained as such uh, in prison, until there was a, a, an amendment to the Barber and Cosmetology Act, uh, which happened in 2016. It wasn't until 2016 that people uh, in, in, in who, who were trained as barbers or beauticians in prison could come out and be barbers or beauticians, but it required a, the, the passage of a, of, of a congressional of, of an act, the, the passage of legislation. And so, you know, on the local level, we need to do an audit of all of this stuff. And on the federal level, the federal agencies that set guidelines need to think about formerly incarcerated people as they set guidelines. And the one thing I think that'll help them think about this is to remember that over half of the people we incarcerate and far more than three quarters of the women we incarcerate are parents. They have children. This will help us think about the guidelines that we set, I hope, uh, uh, at these agencies as we set them. But we have to we have to pay attention to this question uh, in order for us to do that. Great. I think it's great also uh, that you brought in the issue of women, partly because so much of the data that's been collected is about men. But the right. impact on women is very, very specific as well as general and the impact of women in the community, as well as women who are incarcerated and come home. So thank you for bringing that up. Um, <laughs> your book provides a model for how social science might operate differently. It's scholarly for sure, but also much more personal. How have fellow social scientists responded to your approach? What does the future look like in this respect? <laughs> That's good. That's such a wonderful compliment. Uh, it's been all complimentary. I don't know what to do. This is, <laughs> this is, this is fantastic. Um, thank you so much for that comment. Thank you so much uh, for, for, for that observation. I, I, I hope to do something different. I, I hope that the that it was methodologically innovative, that it was um, that it's theoretically innovative, that it's rigorous, that, that, that folks still see the science involved in it. Because I am a scientist. I'm trained as such. Uh, and, 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 and what I'm trying to do is use the tools at my disposal you know whether that's tools as 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 a storyteller, um, or if that or if those are tools as as a scientist, um, which 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 is which is which is my training. Um, so far, the the book has been really well received, uh, universally positive reviews, and I'm just absolutely grateful. I, I, I keep waiting on the hammer to drop. It's gonna it's gonna drop one day. <laughs> Somebody's gonna write a terrible review of the book. I'm sure. Uh, but 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 so far. Um, the, the book has been has been universally positively reviewed, um, and and when I give talks, folks have received it. Uh, to other social scientists, people have received it largely as you know something that's quite generative. And so and so what's happened? I mean, I, I think this is when um, social scientists are, are being at their best is when we think about um, projects when we think about presentations or, or works of all kinds, art, social science, whatever, um, is when we think about this as an opportunity to build something together. And so, and so the, the way I've been received has been from people who are, you know, in this kind of generous spirit where they're thinking about the ways that we can build from uh, uh, the, the work that we've done. I am sure uh, in a decade or so, or, 
largely before. There are holes in, in my approach, in, in, in the way I'm thinking about things. There's something that I've done wrong, of course. You know, it's the nature of the beast and, and it's necessary for, for improvement. But, but, but what I've experienced are that people are using it so far to help build new things. And I hope that's the future. I hope the future that we go toward is one where um, people respect different kinds of knowledge production, different kinds of theorizing. For me, uh, Nina Simone and James Baldwin are theorists in the same way that Foucault or Bourdieu or any of these other folks are. And for me, Jimmy and Yvette and Sabrina and Ronald and, and the brothers and sisters that I spent time with are theorists in the same way that I am, in the same way that Foucault, Bourdieu, Baldwin, Nina Simone, Fela Kuti, Kamazi, Washington, in the, in the same way these folks are too. So, 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 so I, I hope that the direction is one um, where we take seriously the contributions of people um, who haven't been through the same systems of um, preparation or something like that. Great. I think there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot to talk about about that and, and, and social science and, and research, uh, which that opens up. I think that's great. There's a question that says, um, powerful presentation. Thank you. Since education in prison can be so useful to coming home more successfully, but in New York state, there are forces at work in communities where the prisons are a major employer and they are angry that prisoners were getting a free education. Hence, many prisons eliminated ed education programs. What are your suggestions to overcome this barrier? My dear friend, Ronald Simpson Bay says, um, that you can change all the law and policy you want, but if you don't change hearts and minds with the stroke of a pen, people will, will wipe away your progress. And I, I used to bristle when he said that. I used to bristle because I think that, you know, it really is law and policy. Law and policy is the engine. And I don't think I'm wrong or was wrong, but I think this is one of those both and moments. So the restoration of the Pell Grant is super important. And all the folks that were involved in prison education, including Kathy and Cheryl, and you know, like like these 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 stalwarts um, who have been pushing for, and 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 this shows up in in, for example, the restoration of the Pell Grant, um, uh, and I'm sure there are limitations that I, that I haven't thought through on on that front, but um, uh, it's it's it, the law and policy is very important, but just like uh, during the 1990s. Uh, in, in, in that Clinton administration at the height of what we might call neoliberalization, where people are thinking about uh, allowing people uh, to, to sort of um, make it on their own. You know, you, 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 you get what your hand called for, uh, as, 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 as a phrase might say. And, and the government has no responsibility, very limited with government as problem. Just as we were in this moment of government as problem, which starts, of course, with, with block granting, which, which begins... Um, in the 60s, we start seeing in a deep way in the 70s and just explodes in the 80s under the Reagan administration. Um, just as we see government as problem and things like the provision of Pell Grants for people who we're afraid of, who we've taught ourselves to fear uh, and, 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 to, and, to, and, to, and to hold in disdain, just like that went away overnight because of the way we think and feel about people, we need both uh, a cultural intervention and a policy intervention. So one of the things I'm trying to do is tell stories to help people understand in a deeper way what it means to live under a certain set of conditions and what brings people to it without, without you know, offering, I think there's a, there's a set of, um, there's kind of a, a liberal sensibility that looks for, um, let, let, me, let me explain to you why somebody committed a crime. I'm, I'm not so much interested in the why somebody committed a crime um, as I am in the, conditions under which they lived so that we understand it. Uh, and, 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 and I'm not trying to justify how or why people commit or cause acts of harm. The question becomes, if you understand this person as a human being, a, a person of flesh and blood, um, who perhaps deserves a place in society, what place might that be? Let's move to a place where we begin to imagine a place for them. And so the, the, the intervention in the culture has to happen. Um, which is why I published the book. I wrote it, the book in the way I wrote it, published the book where I published 
um, and, and, and do the work that I do. There's an intervention in the culture that needs to happen um, so that we begin to see and think and, 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 and feel uh, differently uh, about, about people who caused this harm. That's the real test for me. What, do you, what kind of world do you imagine for the person that caused you harm? That's the test. That's the test. And that's the place where I think we need to go. And if we get there, if we get to a place where we imagine a world in which people who cause us harm have a place in the world, are able to provide for themselves, love their families, love themselves, have some sense of worth at the end of this thing, live with dignity, thrive even. If we come to that place, then when we write the next sets of laws and policies that write the ship, when a new administration comes in, we won't wipe it away so fast. Thank you for that. Uh, if the problem is ma of mass incarceration is viewed as a problem of citizenship and not behavior, what becomes possible? Mm. <laughs> These questions are fast. <laughs> That's deep. That's deep. That's a deep question. It's a deep that's question. A, you know, the, the, but the, the question of possibility is the question of the hour. I mean, this is this is right. what the coalitionists are forcing us to deal with, right? Like, what are the possibilities? What kind of world could we have if mass incarceration is about citizenship? Because at base, citizenship is about belonging. Then what's possible is the production of a world in which we make a place for people, even people who we hate. So here's what's possible. What's possible is an ethical commitment to hospitality. What's possible is an ethical commitment to care. Ethical has to be ethical because it has to be about what you believe to be is right in that moment, not how you feel in a moment. And what we've been governing through is our feelings. And this might seem a little bit counterintuitive because, you know, I spent a little time saying in this conversation, try to get in touch with the feelings. How do you feel in the given moment? This kind of thing. Absolutely. And then make the ethical commitment, not based on how you feel, but based on what's right or wrong, acknowledging how you feel, despite in some ways how you feel. What's possible if we think about this as a, as a question of citizenship, then we'll think about people with criminal records, not just as risks, but as fully human participants in the human community who deserve rights, who deserve to contribute to the people they care for and the communities that they belong to, and who deserve protections. A framework of protections is almost completely missing from our discussions of criminal justice reform. We almost exclusively discuss reform uh, uh, along questions of service, access to services. How do I get somebody something that helps them, uh, that helps prevent them from hurting me again? That's the question we ask. We don't think about them as folks in need of protection like everybody else. And so what we'll do is we'll, we'll have services that provide jobs, but we'll have no recourse when an employer abuses them. We'll have services that provide a couple few sets of housing based on the limits of, of, of our charity. The limit of how I feel about a thing and whether or not doing right by them, doing right is the wrong word, doing good by them makes me feel good. No, we need an ethical commitment to a politic of hospitality, to, to a welcoming of the stranger. We need an ethical commitment, especially an ethical commitment, to make sure there's a place that belongs to people who do us harm. And I think the framework of citizenship allows us access to that. Because again, citizenship is about belonging and citizenship is expressed, not just through law and policy, not just through legal standing, but it's expressed in our everyday lives. It's expressed in our every interaction. This comes from Baldwin, of course who tells us in the opening of, 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 of my talk, at least, um, of the millions of details 24 hours a day that spell out to you that you're a worthless human being. The interaction with the landlady, the police officer, the landlord, he says the Western Union service clerk. So I flip it. That's, that's the exclusion that you face as a black person in a country that is anti-black. That's the exclusion you face in 1965. That's the exclusion that people face today in 2021 when they have to check a box, when the box follows them into the unemployment line and to the pillow with their lover even, if we think about Jimmy's example. But what's the flip side of that? The flip side of that is belonging. 
The flip side of that is full inclusion within a human and political community. The flip side of that is the power to make and even remake things in one's own image. That's what I think uh, the framework of citizenship allows. I think citizenship has limits, of course. And the scholars of citizenship, you know, may write a review of this book and, and talk about the limits, you know, and that's fantastic. And I, I welcome it. Um, but I think it allows us a more expansive view of the possibilities um, than, than the one that we have today. I mean, that could be a beautiful ending to this, but we have so many more questions that I'm going to take us to the limit, at least. Let's do it. Let's do it. <laughs> what can we do as ordinary citizens to make a difference? And what can social workers do? Social workers can do a whole lot. I'll come to ordinary citizens in a hot second. Though, I mean, we're all ordinary citizens, um, but we have jobs. We have roles that we play. We do things in the world. And social work is, 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 is a field that is... That, 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 that straddles um, resource rich institutions and resource poor people. And what social work does when it does it beautifully is it's a bridge. And what social work does when it does it beautifully is it allows for a kind of healing and a restoration. Social work can be a force for the provision of this radical community based on a politic of care and hospitality. But social work has to shake off uh, the ways that it's been taught to, to view the world <laughs> as needy, um, uh, as the object of pity, which means social work has to allow agency among people who are the objects of social care which means you have to allow, social work has to allow for people to make mistakes, to be wrong. You gotta deal with the uglier things in society. You gotta look square-eyed, cold-eyed, steely-eyed at the harm, because there is harm, because people do awful things. Social work sees these awful things. And social work, because it comes from a place where it has a commitment to justice, should and could, I think, if it shakes off its problems, participate in the remaking of the world in such a way that allows for self-determination, that allows for the fullness, the full expression of the lives that people want to make for themselves. That's what I think. That's that's you asked me my opinion. That's my opinion. That's not the gospel, right? Like, that's, that's my opinion. You know, that's my opinion. <laughs> as, as, as far as ordinary citizens. Um, I think a few things. I think who you vote for matters. I think the way you organize, and I, you know, organizing is a role, of course, but it's a role for everybody. It's a role for the people. You know, organizing is about the people. Who you organize with, how you organize. In fact, organizing is the bedrock, in my opinion, of, of, of the democratic project. It's about people getting together to, 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 to make the world that they want. That doesn't mean that our, our democracy reflects that. That's not what I'm saying at all, but I'm saying in, in theory, um, it, is, it, is, it is the bedrock, the idea of association. This is what makes incarceration so awful because it tells you you must break your associations with the people that you're closest to. You must cut off ties with your cellies, rappies, bunkies, et cetera. You know, number six or seven on this long list of things you're handed on your sheet of the, the, the sheet that you're handed on the, with conditions of release, you know, perhaps after, um, you know, don't use drugs or after, you know, don't drink or after don't cross state lines is going to be don't associate with, quote, known offenders or don't associate with felons or something like that, um, which is nearly impossible um, from the neighborhoods from which we, we typically call uh, people into the criminal justice system. But this breaking of association is the breaking of the democratic project. And so ordinary citizens, Ordinary citizens with criminal records, ordinary citizens who don't have criminal records, ordinary citizens who are connected with people with criminal records, which, by the way, is half the country. One or two people connected to someone have a loved one who's ever been to an American jail or prison. Ordinary people can organize. Ordinary, ordinary people can think about who they vote for. Ordinary people can educate themselves on the, on the, on the experiences of, 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 of people that we've thrown away. Ordinary people can demand on their workplace that we don't throw people away. Ordinary people can exert their power from the place that they are, wherever that is, wherever that is. We have power. What is it? 
identify it and use it. Use it on behalf of the people that we've thrown away. This is this is this is what ordinary people can do, I think. Yeah, I think that's a terrific answer. And I'm going to take it now for a second in the opposite direction, which is a challenge. What would you say to those who are averse to including formerly incarcerated people into their social circles for fear of recidivism, PTSD, or permanent mental trauma that such people may be carrying due to the ex experiences with the carceral system and exposure to the crime world? I say you live in the wrong country. <laughs> I mean, not to be dismissive, it came off that way, but, but, but really one or two Americans has a formerly incarcerated loved one. One or two Americans. So, 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 so we can't live here and not engage this question. You certainly can't do work with the poor. You can't do work with the poor and engage this question. You know, the, 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 you know, it's interesting. There's, there's, a, <laughs> there, there, there's a study that came out in 2016 by uh, Brame and colleagues, B-R-A-M-E et al, 2016, that looked at um, the rates at which white and black men are arrested, among probably some other things, this thing that always sticks out to me. And what they found was that 49% of black boys will be arrested before they turn men, before they hit the age of 23 a lot of arrests. It's a lot of people. That's half of all black boys in this country are going to be arrested. That same study found that 38% of white boys will be arrested before they turn 23. 38%. Another study, a different study. This is from Lee, Hetty Lee and colleagues. Brilliant work on the connectedness to incarceration. This is where the forward study sort of draws, you know, like draws the analysis, sort of leans on this kind of stuff to, anyway. Found in 2015, so we've known a while longer, that 44% of black women are connected to uh, someone or have a loved one who is currently in a jail or prison right now. That same study, it's a lot of folks, nearly half of black women are connected to somebody in jail or prison right now. That's, that's egregious, terrible. That same study found that one in eight white women have a loved one. They are connected to someone who is right now in an American jail or prison. So here's the thing. American racism has taught us to distance ourselves from this problem. We think that criminal justice, uh, uh, the, the criminal justice system, uh, that 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 punishment, that 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 the prison, that jails are a black thing. This is what we think, and I'm not saying it's not. The statistics are there, and they're egregious. Again, five to one incarceration rate, twice as likely to be arrested in the first place, do more time when they get arrested, and are more likely to be arrested for no reason. If you look at stop and frisk studies, for example. Black folks get the boot. Latinx folks get the boot if we figure out how to count them, <laughs> right? Because, because right, like, like, like we figure out how to count Latinx folks, they get the boot. Indigenous Americans, you know, First Nations people are murdered by police at the highest rate that we have in this country. But we don't pay any attention to them. We don't pay any, because we've erased them from our imagination is another example of how American racism works. But another way that American racism works is that there are nearly 1 million white people in an American jail or prison today. And we think that mass incarceration is a black problem. We think that mass incarceration stops at the threshold of the black family, which allows us to say something like, this isn't, uh, this isn't uh, listen, listen, that question is a beautiful question. I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. But it allows us to think that there's some distance between the average American and the problem of prison expansion and jail expansion in this country, or the expansion of the carceral state. And there is literally no distance between us and, and, and people that we lock away in, in, in our cages. It's, it's that these folks are not just our neighbors. These folks are our family members. These folks are our lovers. These folks are our friends. And I'm struck uh, by how many people tell me, my husband, wife, son, daughter, sister, cousin, brother was locked away and how often those people aren't poor, aren't black, aren't from groups 
that we associate with the prison. Right now, poverty is concentrated in the suburbs. Right now, rural incarceration rates are meeting and exceeding incarceration rates in the city. This is a giant American problem. I think on that note, you've just involved everybody to imagine that this is partly their problem and their family's problem. And this is a problem for everybody that lives here. <laughs> and that's left us with the challenge about how to move in that direction in the analysis and the narrative. There are many, many more questions that people have to ask you. And I think what it means is you have to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Happy to. <laughs> oh, I want to I want to really, first of all, urge everybody to read the book because it will allow you to continue to to answer some of the questions you may have as you read it. And then secondly, just to thank you so much for being with us tonight. It, it was a uh, it was tremendous. And I'm, I'm so glad. Kathy, thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, and thank you. And thank you to my host. And thank you for folks who, who hung out with us tonight. Thank you. Uh, I have to jump in. Thank you, Dr. Miller yes. and Dr. Boudin for an extraordinary experience. Uh, really, uh, Dr. Boudin, superb moderating. Thank you. And Dr. Miller, thank you for your incredible work. You're taking a truly novel and ingenious approach, tying together the data and, and, and the personal impact in ways that are both striking and seamless at the same time, to, to way, the way I hear it. Um, I, I know you've stirred an enormous response in our audience uh, here. Uh, if you haven't read that the book, please, please do. Uh, it's, it's just remarkable, as you've heard in this discussion. Uh, so uh, again, thank you both. And thanks to everyone for joining us. Best wishes. Thank you. Thank you.